Welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast with your host, Johnny Gorky. You have the power to overcome challenges and fears. Let my voice and the voice of many others show you how to transform these challenges into opportunities. To learn more about future podcasts and read episode show notes, check out my website at www.thepowerofyourvoice.com. This is episode 25, and today's guest is Fatima from careertuners.com. Over the last nine years, she's helped hundreds of ambitious people land their dream jobs and achieve their career goals by helping them with their resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn profiles, and personally coach them through mock interviews. Hey, Fatima, welcome to the Power Your Voice podcast. So I want to ask you important question. So nine years ago, you started an online company called Career Tuners, where you have helped hundreds of people land their dream job. For those listening to this podcast, how did you get your start and what made you decide to start Career Turners? Um, That's a really good question. I got my start when I was uh, at UCLA. This was during the recession and I was encountering that a lot of my fellow classmates were having trouble paying their fees um just because the at that time it 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 was it was a historically unprecedented tuition hike it was like never before seen and you know everyone's parents were unemployed and etc um but i was actually making more money going to school than not and the reason for that is because i was really good at recycling my scholarship application essays uh, in order to win scholarships. So I realized that I'm really good at figuring out how to talk to people about my strengths, how to um, make them, uh, how to basically think about their needs, think about what they're looking for in a candidate and then speaking to that need through my writing. And I realized that a lot of my classmates were having a hard time with that. They were like, well, how are you able to, you know, write about yourself so well? How are you able to win so many scholarships? Can you teach us? And I started looking over their essays. I started realizing that their writing basically lacked something, right? Like lacked confidence or it lacked uh, insight into their reader. It lacked something that was basically preventing them from being successful with their application essays. So I started helping people with their scholarship essays for free. And uh, once I realized that there was a need for that, I started charging grad school applicants for um, help with their resumes and help with their grad school application essays. And it sort of snowballed from there. I did that for about a year. um, But of course, grad school has its seasonality. So that was not a sustainable business model. Once I realized that this is something that I could help people with systematically because I'm really good at teaching people systems, um, how how to think and how to write and all that, I decided to branch out into the professional world. And that's how that's how Career Tuners was born. That's great. And as a woman, just to go into the business thing, there's a lot of women who probably want to start a business they don't maybe have the confidence to to do that and they want to. How are you able to overcome that? And like, you know what, I'm going to start my own company. Um, it wasn't really like a overnight decision, to be honest. I feel like it was kind of thrust upon me because it was just something I was doing alone. I was just doing it because I felt like it was a lot of fun. It was very, um, I loved when people, you know, had, confidence when they looked at their stuff and they're like, well, I can't believe I've done all of that. Or, oh, I didn't know I could talk about my journey in that way. Um, so that experience was so much fun and it was so addicting that I kind of didn't even realize that I had a business. It was just like, oh, this is what I'm doing as a freelancer until it got so big that I had to help, that I had to um, hire help, basically. And I did that. I first just hired like a really basic administrative assistant just to help me with kind of the more boring parts of what I was doing. And then I started hiring people that did exactly what I was doing so that they were doing kind of the more exciting parts of of the work. And that's kind of how it grew. Uh, It was very, very slow. It was very accidental. And it was something that I feel was 
given to me as opposed to me actually reaching out and going after it myself. That all changed recently. I think recently I did become a lot more serious. I would say about three to four years ago, I became a lot more serious. And I started aggressively opening up the bottlenecks that I was experiencing in my business. And um, then I think I was like, yeah, I'm a business owner. This is what I'm experiencing. And this is what I need to fix in order to grow my business. Yeah. And what you do is so very important because, you know, I, I do recruiting. When it all comes down to helping people with their careers, there are a lot of people who are very, very talented at what they do. They just don't know how to write it. And because of that, they're making a lot less money than what they should be doing or should be should be getting. And this goes into our next question. So what are the biggest mistakes that people put into their resumes, cover letters, and also their LinkedIn profiles? Because that's a big, big thing. Yeah, I think the biggest mistake that people make when working on these um, on these documents is they don't really know their audience, you know, they don't really fit their narrative to meet their audience's needs, basically. And a lot of people are extremely talented and they're like, well, you know, if you can just put my, you know, everything that I've done on this resume, I'm sure I'll get opportunities. And of course, it does happen that way. There are people that are recruited because they have a very unique skill set. But a lot of times it's not that easy and it is a lot easier and the job search process does go by a lot more quickly if you're able to identify your audience's needs and just speak to them about what's relevant to them. So a lot of people these days have had very um, meandering career paths, especially after the recession, you know, if it's, things are not so linear anymore. You don't just stick and stick with one industry anymore. You don't stick with one company. Definitely for years and years and years, you hop around, you explore this, you explore that. So what happens is a lot of people end up with resumes that are kind of, um, they also meander just like their career paths. And it's important to understand how to talk about your transferable skills, how to talk about your soft skills and how to remove content that is not in line with your readers hiring needs because you don't want to overwhelm them with information that isn't relevant to them. So that's, I think the biggest mistake that people make. Yeah. Well, one of the things I also see sometimes too, I don't know if you see this as much, but sometimes people will literally work at three or four companies and they will literally copy and paste the entire job description. Like I did this, 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 at this company, and it's all the exact same thing. And we both know there's no way you worked at four companies and did a hundred percent exact same thing. And I feel yeah. that, you know, if I was interviewing a person and you see that you're like, is this person being lazy and it's not being disrespectful to them, but it's like, if the person's not going to take the time to write a job description for each job that they had, it's like, what's going on with this person, you know? Exactly. And you want to show um, growth. You want to show like, hey, at the beginning of my career, I did something smaller and now I'm doing something much bigger because it shows a dedication to your professional strengths that I think if you don't do that, you, it'll almost look like you've been demoted or like, hey, why, why is this guy plateauing? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that, that happens too. So you kind of mentioned stories. When people's resumes do they kind of put stories in there or what, what, what are some of those things that, that when you say stories that, that could help a person? Um, I think it really depends on your industry and what your story actually is. Uh, if you are in a very conservative industry like finance, you can't really get away with as much creativity on your resume as you would if you were going after like um, a sales job in, in the software industry. Right. Um, some industries are a lot more open to creativity and some pe- some industries actually encourage it. So if you have, I guess, what you can what what employers might consider red, red flags in your history, you have to be kind of creative with how you present the narrative. You have to be transparent. You have to be honest, but you also have to be strategic. Um, so, for example, mothers, when returning to the workforce, they might be like, well, I don't know what to do for my maternity leave because I was not working. Well, it's important to show that you were up to date with your industry in that time. You didn't 
let go of any knowledge or skill sets. You didn't let yourself get rusty. Even if, even if your maternity leave is 10, 15 years, showing that, hey, you know, I st- kept myself updated by taking such and such courses, by volunteering at my child's school and organizing these fundraisers, whatever. You know, it's important to show the reader something, um, understanding what their uh, hesitances may be and addressing them strategically. I think that's what I mean by stories. And that makes a very good point because, yes, nowadays, you know, you have stay-at-home mothers and fathers who, when they submit their resume to somebody, they may not show that they've worked somewhere for the past couple of years. And then I think, too, one of the challenges a lot of times now when you submit a resume online, it's not a human being who's looking at it. It's a computer. Mm -hmm. What are some things that a person could do to help their resume get to the top of the list when it's going to be a computer who's looking at their resume? Um, Well, the two things I think that these applicant tracking systems focus most on are your previous job titles. Obviously, if I want to hire like a salesperson, let's say, the first thing I'm going to do is look for salespeople near me that are looking for jobs. I'm going to search by that job title. So it's important that your job titles are in line with what you'd like to do. And this is tricky for some people because um, some companies have really, you know, interesting nomenclatures for their job titles. You might be called a quality engineer, but you might actually be a project manager at your company, you know, things like that. And that can hurt you because if you are a project manager and you're looking for project management jobs, but you are, um, you know, you're, you've been called a quality engineer, what do you do? How do you optimize your resume for applicant tracking systems? One of the things you can do is you can put your proper job title. You can say, I'm a quality engineer, and then in parentheses, in bold, you can say project manager equivalent or project management duties, whatever is accurate. But you want to make sure that it's before the company name, it's before the date, it's right next to your job title so that it gets picked up as a keyword when you are applying for jobs. And then another thing, of course, is you want to sprinkle t- um, hard skills, hard keywords throughout your resume that show your technical aptitude as it relates to that specific job that you're interested in. So um, one of the things you could maybe include is your knowledge of specific software, your knowledge of specific languages, workflows, processes, uh, certifications, things like that. Just going through the job description, seeing what language they use and kind of mimicking that in your resume is a good way to make sure you rank well in applicant tracking systems. And honestly, if you do it once for like maybe a set of two to three jobs, you don't really have to keep doing it again and again. Your resume should be good to go for all sorts of similar jobs. Yeah, because sometimes you hear situations where people are like, well, I posted my resume online to 200 jobs and they haven't got any callback. And I'm thinking if these are a lot of different jobs, but they haven't changed their resume at all to reflect those, those certain skill sets that they're looking for, that's the reason why they're probably not getting callbacks. And also, of course, it's because somebody hasn't looked at their resume. But then one of the things I'm thinking too, and this is probably the issue that you have with these automatic systems, you might have a person that submits their resume for a job. That person might be perfect for another job at that company, but because they're using this system and a person isn't looking at the resume, they might be overlooked for that other position. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that could definitely be the case. And if you're applying to like hundreds of jobs and you're not hearing back, there's probably an issue with your contact information or the formatting of your resume um, because that's a that's a huge, huge, huge number. And um, you should at the very least be getting rejections, if not, you know, at least a couple of, of warm, uh, warm inquiries. So that that would be very troubling to me if that's something that I would personally experience. I would make sure that my resume is formatted in a very simple way, in a way that these applicant tracking systems can parse easily and that um, my contact information is up to date and correct. So it's very important for people to realize too, there's certain types of formats that they should use instead of, you know, sometimes you have these people that create these resumes and they're a little bit fancy and they're add like all these colors and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And the simpler, the better, because if the simpler you are, the less, you know, the less likely it is that you'll offend someone. Um, and uh, of course, it, it improves legibility for applicant tracking systems. 
Good, good. Thank you. So what do you think when you put numbers in your resume, what else do you show your accomplishments? So that's a really good question. And a lot of people do have jobs where they're like, well, I can't, you know, disclose this number or this is not the kind of industry where I would have numbers for this. Um, so that's a, that's a problem that I think a lot of people run into. And the easiest way to showcase your accomplishments, and I have an article on my blog about this, is basically to talk about the changes you've helped implement. What improvements did you help make? What opportunities did you help capitalize on? What bottlenecks did you open up? Uh, what did you make more competitive? What did you make more compelling? Uh, basically, how was the situation when you were hired and how is it better now? Thinking about it that way would help you get accomplishments that may not have numbers tied to them, but it's not really all about numbers. It's making sure that your resume is engaging to read and that you look like a very dedicated professional. And having that narrative structure is important because that's what human beings are, you know, we're programmed to really enjoy stories with drama, with some sort of change in it and focusing on that as opposed to saying, hey, I came in and I worked on this every single day, day in and day out. As opposed to doing that, if you say, hey, this was a problem and I fixed it, that's a lot more engaging to read and you will come across as a better communicator and a more dedicated professional. Yeah, because I think well, most companies, they want to hire people who are very good at troubleshooting. That's a very important skill to have. Exactly. So would you think the standard, but back, back in the days, I always heard you should be able to put everything on one page on your resume, sometimes two pages. But if you're really very description about all these different things, have you done how you're really supposed to do that within one or two pages? Um, I think there's an art to it. I think by, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to high school algebra. If you guys remember in, in high school algebra, there was something that we did called combining like terms. Oh, where yeah. you would put all the X's on one side and all the Y's on one side. Well, you kind of have to do something similar when writing your resume in order to make sure it's as concise as possible. Group all the similar ideas together. Are you being repetitive? Is there room to consolidate things? So this is like a very, um, this is something that I don't want people to worry about until it's like the final, final, final stages of the resume writing process. Because what a lot of people do is they edit and write at the same time and they paralyze themselves into not writing anything or second guessing and they end up with something that's really weak. A better way to do it is to write as much as you want, whether your resume ends up being three to five pages, it doesn't matter, then go back in and then edit it critically. Um, so writing without any inhibitions is really important and then going back and editing it using the math part of your brain is the best way to go. And that's how I personally write all the resumes that, um, that we work on. I like that, that's good. How do you create a resume that really targets multiple jobs? Because that, that's a big thing too. You know, a lot of times people will create a resume and they feel that they have to change it. But if you can do exactly what you say, you can target multiple jobs. That's extremely helpful. It's more efficient and saves a lot of time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would do that with certain limitations, of course. I think it would be difficult to create a one size fits all resume that would actually perform well. But if the jobs that you're interested in are roughly similar, for example, industrial engineering and maybe, uh, I don't know, supply chain analysts, they, they could be fairly similar in, in certain settings, right? In certain companies, if you're like a very entry level candidate, if you just got out of school and you can conceive of using one resume for both jobs. What, what you can do to, um, ensure that you don't put in too much effort into reworking your resume is making sure that the top third of the resume gives the impression that you want to give. So the first sentence, if it's like a summary of your experiences, just squeeze in the job title there. Uh, the technical skills section, make sure it's up to date given the language used in the job description. Things like that. Um, that first impression is really important so that when readers read your resume, they're reading with the perspective that, oh, this person's interested in industrial engineering as opposed to, I kind of don't know what this person wants. You know what I mean? So that, um, taking that step really helps because when you read something and you are, you know, introduced as, as something, the resume is read with that impression in mind. So I could start the resume. I could have like a business development resume for both sales and marketing roles. And I could have sales really heavily 
alluded to in the first third, that resume will be read with an impression that, oh, hey, Fatim is really good at sales versus if I really heavily allude to marketing in the first third, the same exact resume, even though the bottom two thirds is, you know, exactly the same, it will be read more with a marketing flavor in mind. So that first impression is, I think, critical. It sure takes a special skill to write a right, really good resume. This is why it's great that you do what you do. Thank you. Thank you oh, so you're much. You're welcome. Your company helps people by, by providing interview coaching, which I absolutely love. What do you think are some of the biggest things that people should remember when they do these interviews? Because that, that's very, very important. Yes, of course. Um, first and foremost, there is such a thing as talking too much or sounding too enthusiastic. Each of your answers should be 60 seconds or less in length. And the way you can do that is just count the number of sentences that you are speaking. If there are roughly five sentences that you have spoken, that's about 60 seconds. And you have five fingers on one hand, so you can kind of tap your fingers as you're speaking. Um, what people will do is they'll get really excited about a job and they'll just go on and on and on and they'll keep speaking and speaking and speaking. And what you risk doing is two things. First, you risk boring your audience. The second thing that you're risking doing is that you risk giving away some sort of liability. Um, so what you can do to keep your, re your uh, you know, interviewers engaged is you can say, I can elaborate more on this if you like. And, you know, gauging what they say, like you can say your five sentences, they can say, tell me about yourself. You can say your five sentences, first sentence is um, why you're passionate about the field. Second sentence is how you got your start. Third sentence is how you built your skill set. Maybe the fourth sentence is how you want to continue building that skill set. And then the fifth sentence could be something about um, how you are excited to grow in that company and why you are excited to interview for that specific position. And then you can say, would you like to hear more about that? And if they say yes, you can, you can say, of course, uh, you know, which part or you can, I mean, obviously you'd have to uh, play it by ear at that point. So um, I think that is, is a critical thing that a lot of people mess up on. And then the second most critical thing that I, I kind of can't believe that people mess up on is they don't prepare, um, which is a very easy thing to fix. And uh, you, you should most definitely be prepared for, for your interviews. Yeah, well, 60 second rule. I, I love that. That is really, really good. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, because I'll, I'll be honest. I, yeah, like, like you said, a lot of people, you know, you send your resume and yes, you get that phone call and you do the interview and now they want to have you come into the office and do a sit down interview and you're super excited. Your energy is like all pumped and then you just talk and talk and talk and talk. And then maybe you don't get that phone call and then you go home and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I probably just talked too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 60 second rule. That's, that's great. I like that. And a lot of people aren't aware that they're doing it. So just kind of, you know, record yourself, do some like, uh, uh, look at some sample interview questions online, record yourself answering them as you would an interviewer, and then listen to them again. If you find yourself tuning out to your own responses, that's a bad sign. Yeah, well, and that's great that you do the Mamak interviews for 20 minutes because I think that is extremely helpful. And I'll tell you my own personal experience. Like when, when you're in college, I don't know, you know, how it was where you went to school. But honestly, like our school, they don't spend a lot of time in helping people with their resumes and interviews and all that kind of stuff. So it's like people, they go to school, they graduate, they get good grades, but they're not really always prepared to do an interview and to send out the resumes. And that's one of the big things. Just because you went to college does not necessarily mean you're going to get a job if you don't know how to do a resume and you don't know how to interview. Those are very important things to know how to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What, what are some of you, because you've been doing this for a long time, biggest success stories of those people who've used your services? Let me see. That's a hard question just because so many are coming to mind. I would say one of our biggest success stories was uh, this gentleman that wanted to transition he was very passionate about nonprofit work and humanitarian efforts, and he had been trying to get into the United Nations for so long that he had accepted work at his wife, wife's cupcake shop in the meantime, just to support his family. And just, you know, the United Nations is an organization that's very um, almost bureaucratic in their hiring processes. They're very rigid and very linear and very traditional. So 
it was it was challenging to communicate his uh, his uh, journey in a way that would be attractive to, to that sort of you know culture and um, the way we did that is yes we talked about his transferable skills the work that he had been doing with his wife but we also focused very heavily on his volunteer efforts because a lot of people kind of dismiss really critical uh, really brilliant things about the work that they've been doing that is hey this is not something that would be appealing to to my target employer um, and they do themselves a disservice so what we did is we shined the we shone the light on his volunteer experiences his his activism you know other things where we could showcase his desire to give back and uh, and he ended up getting a job with the United Nations so that was I think that was one of my favorite stories just because it was very um, it was very touching to hear that he finally made it uh, that was very exciting for us. That's great. Well, and of course, the big thing is too, by helping somebody with their resume, that can help them land a job that helps them support their family and they can make a lot more money, which mm-hmm. is at the end of the day, you know, everybody's all about making more money. So for those listening right now, what are three important things that you think everybody should take away from this interview about creating that lasting impression for their future employees with their resumes and their interviews? If you're working on a resume right now, I would recommend visiting my website and checking out the blog and the free resources that we have because they are very comprehensive. But if you're not looking for a job at this time, you shouldn't really be working on your resume. I think you should only start working on your resume if you have a concrete set of jobs in mind that you'd like to explore. If you have that already, that's great, and you should begin working on your resume. But if you don't know where you're going to be, if you don't know what kind of jobs you're going to be searching for, please don't wait to start a journal of what you've accomplished at your job. One of the biggest things that we struggle with with our clients is they don't remember what they've done. They say, well, I don't know, that's it's been so long ago that I don't remember exactly what, you know, what I did as recently as five years ago. And that's a big, big problem. If you've contributed so much to your work and you can't keep track of it, every time someone says something nice about your work, write it down. Every time you complete a project, note down just maybe three points about, about the project, just so that when in the future you can remember that, hey, this was the project that I worked on, this was the budget, and this is what I achieved. Something as simple as that. Um, that will come in handy, and it'll be a great source of interview prep for you as well. It'll be a great source of material for your resume, of course. Uh, and uh, it's just going to keep your confidence really high. That's great. Yeah, because you might have a person that could work at a company for, say, I don't know, five, ten years, and they constantly get promoted. But they don't write those notes. They don't know what they've done over the years. Exactly. Exactly. So by by taking notes, that could be really, really helpful. Because yeah, the person's probably accomplished a lot of great things, but they can't remember everything. You know, life happens. Mm-hmm. That's good. Because you're working with people with resumes, all that kind of stuff, and I'm sure there's certain times of the year you're a little bit more busier than others. When do you think is probably the best time for people to look for a job, to submit their resume, all that kind of thing? Honestly, kind of always. I, I would dedicate, you know, just maybe like, 30 minutes a week, if you're not even actively looking at all, if you're like the most passive candidate on the planet, I would still dedicate maybe 30 minutes a week to just applying because you never know when there's going to be a better opportunity. You And continuing to interview and continuing to explore opportunities gives you information on how competitive your salary is given what your job duties are. So I wouldn't say there's, you know, there's, um, you there's a time that you shouldn't be applying. I do know for a fact though that hiring slows down in November and December. So if you want to get a job by the end of the year, I would recommend starting now, getting a head start because it might take a couple months. It might take a couple months. So for all those people who are listening to this podcast episode and like, you know, I need to fix my resume or my gosh, I'm not that good at interviewing. Well, what are ways that people can reach out to you, find you online? Yes, uh, you can reach me at careertuners.com. That's C-A-R-E-E-R-T-U-N-E-R-S.com. Or just give me a call or text at 951-284-5404. All right. And and how can people find you on LinkedIn? My LinkedIn URL is linkedin.com slash I-N slash Fatima. That's F-A-T-E-M-A-H. 
and then the letter M. All right, great. Is, is there anything else you'd like people to take away? Uh, yeah, just make sure that you keep yourself up to date on your industry. Make sure you keep your journal up to date and uh, make sure you keep your messaging relevant to your audience. All right, great. Thank you so much, Fatima. I really, really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Johnny here. Thank you for listening to the Power Your Voice podcast. I'd love to get your feedback on this episode and how it impacted you. If someone in your life could benefit from this episode, share it with them. Check out thepoweryvoice.com to read show notes, leave a comment on the blog page, and to stay updated on all future episodes, subscribe to this podcast and leave a five-star review. Thank you for your love and support.